name's Michael Halem. I'm from LNR Invest, and I'm not a doctor, but I do play one on TV. Can <laughs> you up? So um, this is a, I guess, the fourth generation of brilliant experiment. Let's see if I can take it with me. Um, when <coughs> I came to this experiment, it was in the beginning of April 2015 and they were seeing what they thought were interesting results and I wanted to validate that. So, uh, you know, quick nomenclature, HHD is hydrogen hot tube. Uh, and so they have two substantially identical experiments running, one at their Berkeley headquarters, which is where they build them up, and the other one they shipped down to SRI where Fran and Mike McCuber at the time were running it. Uh, my objectives was to prove conclusively if possible that the HHT was producing excess energy not explained by conventional sources. Uh, I took an agnostic position that I didn't care if it was controlled electron capture, you know, uh, uh, LENR, or what was causing that excess energy. That's uh, uh, for theoreticians, and I was going to do the experimental side. I wanted to identify all the possible sources of external energy being added to the experiment and I wanted to identify all sources of measurement error. So I did that as best I could. Uh, the machine is shown, uh, this one is actually at SRI in their cage. Uh, the cage is in case it blows up, it doesn't hurt anybody. Uh, you can see it's a small rack. The machine is uh, a laser point over here. Over here they have a mass spectrometer. This thing's a power supply. Uh, and the rest of it is a bunch of tubes and wires. So. Uh, the core of it is this thing here. This is the hot tube. So uh, Fran disclosed, so I'm going to disclose it too. Inner part of it is uh, 316 stainless steel. Next layer is alumina, and, uh, which is actually an insulator. Then the outer layer is uh, nickel, which they put on with a proprietary means. So that's going to fit inside this thing they call the uh, conflap, which is a vacuum-like flange thing. And uh, you can uh, see here is a cutaway, and then I'm going to blow this up in the next slide so I can show you the, the parts a little better. Maybe I have to go closer to the computer. So here uh, is uh, the hydrogen would flow through as the red uh, line. There's an outer tube, which is black here. Uh, the inner tube is dots because it's a cutaway. You couldn't see it because it's in that cylinder. It uh, has a little thermocouple on the inside. Uh, and so that's where the reactive surface is. The hydrogen is on the uh, uh, going to react with the inner tube there and create the heat, and it gets transported out of the experiment, as we'll show. Uh, this triangular shaped thing I call it the trianguloid. It is a copper block. It's got three holes in it. They're equal distant to a, another thermocouple, which is a copper block thermocouple. Uh, the other thing it's equal distance to is a regular resistive heating element. So you got three things. The entire thing has uh, argon gas running as coolant through the outer cylinder of the conflap that was a big fat silver thing and that uh, uh, would supposedly take the heat away. Uh, you'll find out later it's got a lot of other paths. Okay, so here we got a schematic. I'm not going to belabor this because it's very uh, uh, complicated, but there's uh, two um, uh, circuits. This one here is the argon circuit. In theory, the argon circuit could uh, come out the coolant circuit through a heat exchanger. And then it's got the inner circuit, which we can put either hydrogen or as a control, it's helium in the experiment that I did through the uh, inner tube through that concentric core. So uh, to do this calibration, we start with uh, New Newtonian's uh, Newton law of cooling. Uh, it's an exact analogy to, uh, I guess, a capacitor and a resistor going to ground that's charged up. And so it's got a simple differential equation. And the uh, and, and I hear people taking pictures. I'm happy to email you the slides too. You'll just contact me after because uh, it's public now. Uh, Newton's uh, uh, we have to modify it for power. Uh, just means that it's going to have a different equilibrium uh, final temperature when we put power in. I think I skipped a slide by accident. So then we're going to add for radiation, which is Stefan Boltzmann law. Boltzmann staring at Stefan, uh, saying, how could you take my law? It was all mine. And uh, so in yellow is the radiative term. It's t to the fourth. And uh, uh, the, this particular differential equation's got no closed form solution. But 
it seems to work uh, um, uh, uh, pretty well that you can solve it numerically. So when you solve it, there's only two parameters you need to really solve for. Uh, I call them case of R and case of C. Uh, case of R is a radiative uh, uh, coefficient, and then case of C is uh, the conduction convection combined coefficient. And so I think of it as a very simple model of a sphere uh, within a sphere that's both radiating, which is shown in red, and conducting convecting, shown with the yellow squigglies. Um, just as a note, as a local approximation, it turns out to look Newtonian over very short intervals. Uh, to thermally calibrate it, I need to uh, actually run some temperatures. Uh, I'm very accelerating because I'm cognizant of our time. Uh, so here's a, a thermal calibration set of data. Uh, the purple uh, is core heater power, which uh, goes in about 10 watt steps from zero up to about 110. Uh, and then uh, the thing that I'm really looking at is what we call the hottest thing in, in uh, this experiment, the core reactor temperature. That happens to be uh, the triangloid uh, thermocouple, not the thing in the middle of the reactor core. Uh, and I have a model to ask why that is, but it's a, a little, uh, it actually it's in the paper, but it's beyond this talk. Uh, but you, you get data like that, and it's going to settle exponentially at the next level each time you bump up the power. And I wrote a little uh, exponential fitter in R that I could take one or even multiple exponential decays, uh, add them you know, together, and I could find what that final equilibrium temperature would be for the calibration. So then um, uh, I need to solve for case of R and case of C. Uh, it's nice that everything else drops out except for that. And so I get a little calibration table. And uh, uh, the important thing is, so I take the uh, uh, conductive power, which I calculate by that model that I showed two slides earlier. I take the radiative power in and out, because uh, uh, it's treated as if they're each radiating back and forth to each other, to get the total power. And uh, then I compare it to what was actually uh, measured. And then I get an error. And I sum up the squares of those, get the square root. So I get a root mean square error. And then I tell Excel, and everybody can copy this technique, just minimize that. And when you do, it fits for a case of R and case of C, giving you this nicely calibrated curve, which you can see the data points you know, beautifully you know, fit onto this. And in fact, that little gap there happens to be because this is about two days later. And so something shifted slightly in the experiment between when those data points were taken. But uh, it's a, uh, I think it's a robust technique that anybody could use to calibrate a combined radiative <coughs> conductive convective experiment. So, uh, so next then we have some actual data. So I have some heat generated when we uh, uh, replaced the, those calibrations were done with helium in the inner core. We re uh, replaced it with hydrogen gas. So uh, first thing I want to make a note of is that unfortunately, the argon itself in the, the uh, outer jacket heats. And so each one of these little ripples here is about a 45 minute interval. And so uh, they have a little program on their machine that when it gets down to about 8 psi gauge, it'll charge it up to about 11 and then it decays linearly. So here's the integrated total argon that's uh, thrown into the jacket. And we'll come back to those ripples later. Just notice these little black lines. Uh, the height doesn't mean anything. It just means that the sample occurred when an injection was occurring. But uh, it'll just tell you when the injections, uh, injections are occurring. So we'll look at the next chart, and you'll see the, uh, what, what it does. So uh, here, uh, the red channel is the mass spec uh, uh, channel showing the amount of hydrogen that has been introduced to the circuit. So they obviously turn it on right here. And then after that, uh, this is the temperature of, again, that uh, copper block. Uh, and so uh, interestingly, it dips a little bit, then it rises, has these ripples in it, and then it's going to level off here at the end. So all that was very annoying because I'd like it to just go up monotonically and hit a, a new exponential. So what's happening. Then in addition, the heater power doesn't stay constant because it's got a negative resistive temperature coefficient. So if it gets hotter, they set a constant voltage uh, at the time. We weren't using a, a feedback loop, so-called PID at the time. Uh, it would uh, actually put more uh, current through the thing. So that's all kind of a pain. I had to deal with all of it. So the ripples are obviously some kind of effect that occurs when we inject that gas uh, to top up the argon cooling jacket. Uh, I do more work on that in the paper, which is beyond our talk here, but it's kind of interesting. The other thing that's interesting is the temperature falls and then rises and then falls again. So why would that happen? So I don't think that's actually 
a, uh, a reactive effect of the experiment, but I think instead that's an artifact of, uh, in five minutes I'll, I'll hustle, uh, it's an artifact of the way hydrogen, I believe, permeates into the outer cooling jacket. So here, here we have it, it's calibrated, and uh, I'm sorry, some of the data has some weird symbols as we converted to Microsoft, uh, but uh, you'll see this says uh, we were starting calibrated about minus three watts, gets up to about 11, and then finishes at three. Okay, uh, and uh, so the, the black line's the power, uh, the blue line's the total power from the calibration, and then the red is the subtracted difference and slightly off scale, because uh, I just offset the scales. So I believe that the hydrogen gas permeates into the outer uh, cooling uh, uh, jacket. We actually see some of that, but I did not calibrate it on the mass specs of circuit. This is a simulation showing, uh, and I took right from a, an, an engineering book, how much uh, uh, hydrogen at different temperatures would permeate through 316 stainless uh, onto the other side, and how much argon, we already know how much was injected from the chart that I showed before. So you can see that over time, we would build up hydrogen in the, in the cooling circuit. And of course, the problem with hydrogen is it has 10 times the conductivity of, um, of helium, so it's, a, or excuse me, of argon. So it's a, it's a, a bad gas. So this is a, a non-calibrated simulation of what would happen. So instead of seeing a, uh, this dip, it's about flat, and then it's going to go up and stay about flat again. So it's not calibrated, might not be that way, but it's a possible explanation. So it looks like to me we have hydrogen in the circuit. I've got about three minutes left, so I'm going to go through. So last thing I was worried about is could we have uh, combustion occurring in the center of it, which is exposed to oxygen. I doubt it because the diameter of that tube on the inside is only 3 sixteenths uh, there's be only uh, three millimeters, and there's also conductors and the thermocouple in there, so you wouldn't get a chimney effect, but I couldn't rule it out completely, so, uh, uh, which is an annoyance. Um, and so uh, uh, here's another event uh, similar. Uh, this was the helium calibrated power on it, and uh, here is, again, hypothetical hydrogen permeation adjustment, but not calibrated. And then last one is going to be a heat at after death. And uh, it looks like that on the raw helium calibration, but when I hydrogen uh, permeation adjusted, it looks like it, it, it declined steadily, has an elbow, don't know why, it might be some other kind of an artifact. Um, and so uh, you know, I suspect maybe that the amount of hydrogen was no longer at the critical amount within the nickel to continue the reaction. Uh, it looks like to me that this experiment was making using even the helium calibration, which is conservative, about three times more energy than um, uh, was being put into it. Uh, the weakness is possible hydrogen conduction. There's other weaknesses that we don't have time to uh, go through, but they're, they're going to be in the paper when it comes out in the journal in December. Uh, I'm worried about the insulating effect of hydrogen diffusion in the metal. I don't know. It could be a possibility and uh, other things that could throw off the calibration. I'd like to fix those in the subsequent experiment, which is going to be a version of what Fran is working on. Uh, and I, I certainly want to immerse the entire thing in argon so we can eliminate combustion. And uh, I'd like to also uh, continuously monitor the jacket circuit just in case uh, H2 gets in there. They're using rock bowls and insulator. It would permeate more slowly, but I'd like to at least measure that. And I'd like to actually calibrate it with H2 in case H2 is in there, so that way I can uh, eliminate those variances and know exactly how much it's doing. So, in my opinion, I am 90% sure that's not statistically 90% like in you know 1.75 standard deviations. That's like I think there's a 90% chance that Tesla is going to close on Solar City, uh, that it's producing 12 to 20 watts of excess power. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but that's what I think. Uh, I'd like to uh, close the open issues on the subsequent experiment. As a disclosure, I invested through my company in Brilliant, so I'm not, um, uh, you know, I have a conflict of interest. And uh, there are some references. And then last thing, uh, I just point this out briefly. This guy is Delacroix. This was uh, painted by a guy named Henri uh, Pantin Latour just before the uh, uh, Salon de Refusé, which was a 1863 exhibition of the Impressionists who were uh, refused by the Academy des Beaux-Arts, which is just like us being refused by the conventional science academies. And so, uh, anyhow, so uh, this happens to be uh, a Manet, and in a later one, they, uh, 
uh, uh, painted by him, they have Monet, I didn't throw it in here. And, uh, but of course, in the end, the Impressionists won because they made pictures like that, and the conventional art was considered boring. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Any questions? Thank you.